Professor James Heskett, welcome to Partnering Leadership. I am thrilled to have you in this conversation with me because over the years, I've studied a lot of your work and now your book, Win From Within, Build Organizational Culture for Competitive Advantage. Can't wait to learn some more about organizational culture from you. But before we get to that, would love to know whereabouts you grew up and how your upbringing impacted who you've become and where you ended up. Well, I uh, grew up on a farm in Iowa. Uh, obviously, farming uh, was not my uh, career objective. Uh, uh, so that shortly after graduating from college nearby, I spent a couple of years in the army where I had my first opportunity to to observe leadership in action. Uh, after uh, during the time that I was serving in the army overseas, a buddy uh, convinced me that uh, rather than going into retailing, which was my objective, uh, that I should apply to a graduate business school. And uh, in his estimation, there was only one that was worth applying to, and that was Stanford. So he said, I have an extra application here, fill it out and send it in. So I filled out the application in pencil, <laughs> didn't hear anything from Stanford for months. And uh, finally, uh, uh, just shortly before the beginning of the term, I uh, was notified that I was admitted. So my wife and I piled into a car, went to California and had our first experience uh, uh, with the academic side of leadership, uh, uh, a mentor of mine, uh, Professor Gayton Germain, introduced me to the world of leadership in, in uh, the fields of logistics and transportation and sent me on my way to teach at Ohio State University and later the Harvard Business School with some time off to manage a uh, company that I founded uh, called Logistic Systems. Along the way, uh, I encountered some uh, remarkable leaders and have continued to uh, uh, try to seek out uh, outstanding uh, leaders that uh, believe in the importance of culture in their organizations. And of course, uh, a couple of them that I was fortunate enough to spend some time with uh, were Herb Kelleher at Southwest Airlines, uh, with whom I uh, had a long relationship, and uh, John Bogle at Vanguard Systems, with whom I uh, enjoyed an acquaintanceship, uh, but an opportunity to learn how they uh, uh, how they felt or how they felt about the way that culture uh, enabled their organizations to achieve what they have. Now, Professor Heskett, you mentioned a couple of great leaders, but those two individuals, John Bogle and Herb Keller, couldn't have been more different. So in getting to know them and their leadership, what were the commonalities? Because their personalities were drastically and diametrically opposed to each other. Yes, indeed, uh, you're right. Uh, I, I think what they shared in common, uh, first of all, a very clear vision of how culture uh, might fit into an organization's strategy. At Southwest Airlines, it was the idea of the underdog uh, and uh, uh, fighting against the large uh, competitors entrenched in that industry. Uh, at Vanguard, it was the idea of the consumer uh, of uh, investment products uh, valuing and benefiting from a low cost, high quality uh, service. Uh, so that uh, in a sense, both of those gentlemen uh, had as an important element of their organization strategy, low cost. Uh, Southwest, of course, being the low cost uh, airline at the time, and John Bogle, uh, uh, Bogle being uh, the head or founder 
of uh, an organization that uh, uh, was totally devoted to lower cost for investors uh, with employees being recognized uh, and organized uh, to produce lower costs and uh, with an organization whose performance was measured as much on cost as on investment performance, because as many people know, uh, Vanguard has been a proponent of, uh, and Bogle was a proponent of uh, index funds, which are basically not managed, and uh, but produce a uh, uh, an average return at very low cost, which results in a total return, which is actually higher than most of the other uh, investment opportunities in the market. But both had a, a, uh, a focus on uh, this, this idea and the importance of people in producing uh, that, uh, uh, meeting that objective. They, uh, Herb, uh, used to say that, uh, they asked themselves what kind of an organization they wanted and decided that what they wanted was one in which they could have fun, uh, develop people, uh, produce a loyal working team. And the same was true at, uh, at Vanguard. Uh, through totally different uh, methods, uh, the, uh, the, the working environment at Vanguard is one that uh, induces people to stay. Uh, great level, high levels of loyalty and uh, with resultant impact on lower costs. Now, Professor Eskett, in addition to dealing with the, these two leaders and their organizations, what got you so interested in organizational culture? As you mentioned, initially you had started in logistics, then worked on service organizations. But you, uh, along with John Cotter, wrote a book, and I interviewed John uh, Cotter a few months back uh -huh. on his uh, most recent book on change. But you wrote a book back in 1992 on corporate culture and performance. You've uh, co-written seven books. So culture has been something that you have been uh, researching and advocating for a very long time. What got you so interested in the impact of organizational culture? Well, at the time, uh, going back in the late 80s and uh, the like, I uh, was actually uh, teaching courses and researching in the area of service management at the Harvard Business School and came across some very remarkable uh, service organizations. And it occurred to me that the thing that made those organizations remar remarkable uh, was the culture within them. Uh, the idea that uh, leaders, their leaders understood the importance of culture to the bottom line and practiced systematically the kinds of things that uh, would lead to a, a cooperative, uh, loyal group of employees. Uh, one case that I wrote that influenced me probably more than any other was the Shouldice Hospital case that uh, has been taught uh, hundreds of <laughs> to hundreds of thousands of students uh, about a hospital that did one thing, concentrating on inguinal hernias located in Toronto, Canada, where uh, there was no star system. Uh, people were paid well. They all ate together, the doctors, the nurses, the support uh, staff. Uh, they uh, maintained a, a healthy uh, sense of humor in dealing with people who were having their hernias fixed, of all things. And in an organization where the objective was to turn the responsibility for rehabilitation over to the patient as quickly as possible. So the tradition was that the surgeon uh, would operate on the patient and then invite the patient to put his arm around uh, the surgeon's shoulder and walk with him to the door uh, to begin or signal the idea that 
the patient was primarily resp responsible for his or her uh, own uh, rehabilitation. Uh, and in the process, the, the, the spirit of uh, uh, can do and employee ownership and patient ownership uh, sort of uh, uh, came across so strongly to me that it occurred to me that uh, we ought to be understanding whether or not other organizations are doing this, and if not, why? And that really encouraged me then to uh, join with John in the study that we uh, did to try to measure the impact of uh, uh, culture on performance. And Professor Heskett, I'm proud to say that uh, when I went through Georgetown in Professor Robert Beese's organizational behavior class, oh. we did that case and I still remember it <laughs> like it was yesterday. <laughs> It's an outstanding case on organizational culture and all the different aspects that go into it. Now, one of the right. frustrations or questions I have is that, uh, again, you were at the leading edge talking about the impact of organizational culture and the importance of it. Why is it that still to this day, so many leaders find themselves having a hard time understanding whether they can that's a part of it, and how to impact the organization's culture. Yeah. Well, I think uh, by and large, leaders get the idea now that uh, culture can have a significant uh, influence on performance. Uh, a study done at Duke University uh, several years ago uh, found that 92% uh, of respondents, senior executives, uh, felt that uh, culture was important to performance. The problem was that only 16% uh, felt that their culture was what it should be, uh, which leaves a huge gap, in, as you, uh, uh, I think, are alluding to, uh, uh, in organizations where the leadership understands the importance of culture but isn't doing much about it. Uh, I think that there are several reasons uh, that that leaders are reluctant perhaps to spend a lot of time on it first of all the belief that it takes so long that uh, it probably isn't going to produce results during their tenure uh, in in that ceo's spot uh, also uh, just the idea that um, it requires uh, so mu so many complicated <laughs> steps, or at least they've been convinced that it is uh, a complicated process. That uh, they they have been uh, reluctant to uh, to do it. Third, firefighting takes over. You know, it, 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 it's like. Uh, I like to think of uh, changing a culture and the way people think about it in leadership positions, a little bit like climate change, you know. Uh, we all know that it's important to do, but uh, we'll put it aside because we've got so many things to deal with today that we can't invest in a process that's going to take us months or, uh, as some believe, even years. Uh, now the the whole the purpose of of the book win from within is to try to encourage uh leaders to uh to act with some degree of urgency on the matter of culture change uh in ways that uh enable them to do it within their tenure within the attention span of the organization within a reasonable period of time uh, and uh, as John Cotter has written about the, uh, the importance of urgency, uh, which uh, uh, is always present uh, in the leadership of an organization. John Doerr, the, um, uh, the venture capitalist, the famous, famous venture capitalist, has said that uh, it, time is the enemy of transformation. And uh, most many leaders don't feel that they have uh, the time to do it, or uh, they they actually initiate 
a program and the organization allows other things to take over. And your book serves as a great framework for leaders to reflect on how they can do it well. Uh, Professor Esket, there are a couple of other things that you mentioned in the book that I believe contribute to this. One of them is I think our language as leaders has evolved, but the practices haven't evolved as much. So a lot of leaders talk the talk with respect to organizational culture, but aren't necessarily doing the things or walking the walk with respect to it. And then you also mention that uh, as it is the case with Alcoholics Anonymous or any issue we want to address, climate change, uh, organizational culture, the first step is admitting that there is a problem. And I yes. find with the, what I call the leadership award industrial complex, uh, every mm -hmm. leader is constantly getting awards, being told how great they are, how great right. their organizational culture is. There's a tendency not to reflect on the first step is I need to admit and we need to admit that organizational culture is something that we need to improve. Yes, right. I think I think you're right. Uh, uh, Mike Beer, my colleague, has written on the importance of uh, 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 creating dissatisfaction with the status quo as one of the first steps in the management of change. And uh, I think uh, you might agree that uh, many leaders uh, may not be all that uh, uh, good at creating <laughs> dissatisfaction with the status quo. We've uh, an organization that is performing well can become complacent. Uh, the extreme of that behavior, of course, is arrogance. Uh, you, you, you try as a leader to uh, build pride uh, within the organization and too much pride leads to, to, to arrogance. But the, uh, uh, the whole idea of uh, self-satisfaction, if you will, works against change. People become so satisfied with their performance that they don't see any need for change. Uh, in a sense, this was the case at Microsoft. You know, Microsoft was not going down the tubes in 2014. It uh, was still uh, profiting from its uh, 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 emphasis on, uh, on software and uh, doing reasonably well. The task was to convince people that we could be doing much better and it, wouldn't we all prefer to be doing a lot better, uh, not only for our customers, but for ourselves. And that was the, that was the task uh, confronting the new CEO uh, at that time. And he did a very good job of it, uh, it, it which has enabled Microsoft uh, to be regarded as one of the great turnarounds uh, in recent corporate history. And I do mention the example of Nadella, and I love the way you also describe the experience there in that a lot of times, uh, one of the things I find frustrating is people talk about the importance of culture over strategy. So culture eats strategy yeah. for breakfast, lunch, dinner, yeah. all of those things. Part of right. what you say is that effective culture anchors strategic change. So Nadella Absolutely. at Microsoft, he did have a significant impact on transforming the culture. At the same time, the strategy of leaving behind some of the legacy uh, focus on the PC, uh, on uh, mobile, uh, was a big part of the success of the organization. So the two yes, are indeed. not mutually exclusive. What you say is that effective culture anchors strategic change. Yep. You know, uh, it doesn't uh, serve us well to try to decide what's more important, culture or strategy. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, the situation that uh, Nadella uh, was involved in at Microsoft involved change in both. And uh, it's quite natural. Uh, to work on both at the same time, you don't you don't have to uh, uh, you don't have to have the perfect culture in order to uh, uh, 
uh, change an organization's strategy. But today, uh, in, a, in an era in which uh, organizations have to change strategy uh, frequently, as we saw during the uh, recent pandemic uh, impact, um, you have to have a culture that supports adaptability. That takes us all the way back to the study that John Cotter and I did in uh, 92, in which we uh, pointed out that, uh, or found, uh, based on our data, that strong cultures can be very successful and they can be very unsuccessful. It all depends on the, uh, the nature of the values and the way in which they support adaptability. Because today, we have to have a culture that can support several st strategies and several strategic changes. Because we change our strategy much more frequently than we change our culture. And therefore, we've, if we can get a, a, a foundation laid through an effective culture that will support several strategies, uh, it can provide us with a basic competitive advantage over a, a, a reasonably long period of time. And that's one of the things I found myself reflecting a lot on, Professor Heskett, in reading your book, that strong cultures can be positive or negative, that adaptability is critical to the success. Now, in the book, uh, I love this, uh, uh, at the beginning, you mentioned strategy is hard, culture is soft. The impact of a strategy on growth and profit can be measured, and that of culture cannot. If you get the core values shared by everyone right, the rest will take care of itself. A strong culture helps assure good performance. To change an organization's culture requires a long time. All these assumptions have been passed around in management circles over the years, and all of them are essentially wrong. No. <laughs> That's those, I believe that very strongly. And uh, obviously, John Cotter shares my belief because he wrote the foreword to the book. But uh, based upon what we have found over the years, and in his case, uh, his research in the management of change, uh, th these, these uh, shibboleths, if you will, uh, uh, tend to become embedded in people's minds and uh, they, they uh, uh, discourage so much important action uh, they provide excuses for inaction. Uh, they, they do all kinds of things that um, prevent us uh, from taking full advantage of the important of, uh, importance of culture in bottom line performance. Uh, I think we're seeing that right now. There, there is a, uh, uh, a a significant concern about employee turnover, primarily because uh, millions of people are reconsidering their careers and whether they should maintain their relationship with their current organization or whether they should move, take new jobs, start new careers, what have you. Uh, and uh, in the book, uh, I basically uh, said, uh, you know, there are many things we can't predict, but there's one thing we can predict uh, from this pandemic, and that is that research will tell us that those organizations that uh, created uh, an, an effective, supportive uh, place to work during the pandemic are going to be those organizations that were able to retain their people and come out of the pandemic in better shape, uh, competitively speaking. Uh, I'm certain this is going to be the case. Uh, and the organizations that we're reading about are those organizations that probably didn't do a very effective job uh, during the pandemic when people needed support. They needed uh, the feeling that they were part of an organization and they didn't get it. Uh, and Professor Heskett, you also addressed this in the book. One of the challenges that I see with the leaders that I interact with is that they're finding it very hard uh, maintaining a cohesive culture when operating in rep 
remote, considering what the impact is going to be uh, being hybrid or shifting back and forth to remote. So what are your thoughts and perspectives with respect to how organizations can and leaders can nurture the right kind of culture while being either hybrid or remote, which are two very different uh, modes of operating? Well, I, I learned a lot uh, from a case study that's uh, uh, described in the book, uh, an organization called Critical Mass that's headquartered in Calgary, uh, Alberta, uh, headed by a woman named Diane Wilkins. Uh, they are in, they're in the business of uh, creating uh, good work environments. And uh, so they sp spent a lot of time thinking about this and uh, actually provided me with some uh, good ideas in that regard. Uh, several of which uh, are uh, probably going to uh, create some um, debate, if you will. Uh, for example, uh, I'm becoming convinced that uh, the quality of middle management uh, becomes more and more important in a remote or a partially remote organization. Somebody's got to be there to hold the hands of those people who are uh, alone, uh, if they're new to the organization, they really are alone and uh, unlikely, I think, to ever become a long term employee. Uh, those people are going to turn over because there is no way to uh, bring them into the organization. Well, middle managers can serve not just as coaches, but as advocates, because uh, uh, people working remotely need an advocate back at the home base uh, so that they don't feel that they're being lost and they are feeling that they are becoming lost in in, uh, in large measure so uh, a culture that uh, supports uh, people who are working remotely becomes absolutely critical that means probably budgeting an extra amount for in-person meetings uh, gathering people either on a national or a regional basis, uh, uh, maybe maybe doing like Cemex uh, in Monterrey, Mexico, where uh, their uh, managers all work under something called the Cemex way and periodically get together on an international basis in order to uh, cement those relationships so that they know who they're talking to over the phone and can recognize uh, faces on uh, on Zoom or whatever else uh, they may be using. Uh, because without the face to face contact, uh, almost everything else is lost. Not only do you not get the col collaboration that you seek, uh, but you don't even get the loyalty that you need uh, to maintain an effective organization. So uh, it's really important that we uh, try to bring people together. And when we can't do that, uh, create a, a cadre of uh, people in the middle of the organization who are trained to work in a remote uh, environment and trained to support those people out in the field uh, in ways that perhaps they wouldn't support them at the home, at the headquarters. You know, these are ways that we're not used to, uh, to uh, uh, operating in. And uh, uh, so the training of this core of people becomes very important. Uh, and uh, there are some, as you well know, who believe that middle management is a dirty word. Uh, we've eliminated it in too many organizations uh, as a way of downsizing or resizing. And now uh, some of those organizations, I think are paying the price in a, in a world of remote work that is not going to go away. 
And that's one of the things I've loved about your work, Professor Heskett, and including this book, in that I find in many aspects of life, including in leadership, uh, literature, writing, books, there is a lemming effect where everyone all of a sudden runs in one uh, direction or another. The yes. death of middle managers and not needing any middle managers in organizations is one of those where a lot of people have been predicting and what are the uh, what is the purpose of the middle managers. But you make a mm -hmm. great point that uh, for organizations, most especially operating in a remote and a hybrid environment that is required. You also mention in the book and uh, including by quoting the Gallup uh, study that the relationship with that immediate supervisor and manager is a critical factor to employee engagement. So for a lot of reasons, some of what we have been running to, like lemmings, is counterproductive uh, even in the in-person environment, let alone in a hybrid or virtual environment. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, I uh, I agree, and and it the the real losers in this whole process are new hires. Uh, we have to do a better job of making those people feel like they have a home, that they're part of an organization. Uh, that means quite probably uh, organizing around teams, teams that uh, are not are composed of members that aren't located all across the globe, but uh, in areas where they can occasionally get together and uh, uh, build the, the, the relationships that are important to a team. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, those new hires in this environment are just going to continue to turn over. Uh, we're going to have uh, 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 an increased impact on turnover and employee turnover, as the book suggests, is one of the uh, biggest uh, factors in bottom line performance uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, it uh, not only costs money in and of itself, it costs in terms of productivity, it costs in terms of collaboration. It costs us in so many ways that uh, I'm concerned that uh, what is now occurring, and I'm sure we're going to see an upswing in, uh, uh, in employee retention numbers, or maybe a downswing would be a better way of putting it. Those employee retention numbers are going to uh, take a hit in organizations that aren't doing as well uh, as others, those that are able to at least maintain their employee retention will be the winners. In the book, I, I don't hold out any great uh, hope that uh, people are going to make a killing on culture during the uh, pandemic. My, hope is that uh, an organization can maintain its culture, its employee loyalty, uh, the, uh, the productivity numbers. Uh, I don't expect them to increase all that much, but uh, there will be small victories uh, uh, during this time. As long as the leaders, as you say, Professor Heskett, keep in mind that uh, nurturing that culture is really important. The, over the past couple of years, there has been even more firefighting, some of it by necessity, some of it just because of the pace of change. So mm -hmm. in many instances, uh, uh, some of the leaders that I see have focused less effort on the culture and in their minds, justif uh, justifying it by saying, you know, we are we are trying to, at this point, firefight and keep things going. Yeah, yeah. It you makes know, it one. It's it's a wonderful excuse for not doing anything about culture. Yes. <laughs> and you also have you put a, it off. <laughs> I couldn't. We have to have Zoom meetings, right? So, uh, what can we do? Uh, yes. We're we're <laughs> we're victims of circumstance at this point. Yes. I can, I, la I label that as kind of the the gray swan problem. You know, it's the one that uh, provides us with excuses to put off 
uh, what at some day is going to become a very critical uh, problem in our organization. Uh, and until it does, you know, we can get by. Uh, I think it, 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 the CEO of uh, Fifth uh, Third Bank uh, put it quite well recently when he said, and I'll paraphrase, that uh, we're never going to be a great organization working remotely. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll manage. All right. Don't worry about us, but we're, we're not going to be great, uh, working remotely. And I think that uh, he realizes what many CEOs don't, uh, uh, these days. And I suspect that when, uh, as soon as possible, an organization like fifth third is going to do something about that. Yes, and, and uh, it uh, provides an opportunity again for some of that development that you also mentioned is important for culture, is important yeah. for the employees themselves. Uh, you have a, a beautiful a visual in your book of uh, two options, option A and option B with respect mm -hmm. to uh, organizational culture. And the fact that a single strategy can be effectively executed without Absolutely. having the right culture. And I find sometimes some um, entrepreneurs or others that have had a single success are used as an example of being able to succeed without great organizational culture. Yes. But your option B shows that when the culture is the right culture and platform, it allows for various strategies to be repeatedly effectively executed. Yeah. yeah, I think a current performance only tells us so much uh, about the effectiveness of an organization's culture, because as we all know, uh, you know, a great product, uh, a uh, terrific distribution channel uh, is uh, will will save us for a while. Uh, even if we have problems with culture. Who knows uh, what the future holds for an organization today that uh, it, it has complete control uh, over uh, a, a good share of our economy. Uh, think, about, uh, uh, think about Amazon, for example. Uh, no one holds Amazon's culture up as a great example, but the company's strategy, uh, it, its hold on uh, on third parties, on consumers, its great marketing ideas, its it, the prime, uh, the whole idea of prime membership and the like, uh, is so strong that it 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 creates an organization uh, that obviously has. Uh, performed well and will continue to perform well uh, for some time. Who knows, though, uh, whether or not uh, that that organization's culture at some point may put limits on its uh, ability to uh, 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 to to succeed as it, 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 with in, on a trend comparable to the trend it's been on for the last few years. We yes, won't I... see any collapse. Will we see a leveling out of performance? Who knows? It is, and it, it shows, as you said, when there is a need for those different uh, uh, strategic initiatives, not just uh, one. You do mention the financial impact of culture, whether on employee referrals, retention, productivity. So there is a lot of financial data that supports the uh, importance of great culture. One of the mm -hmm. things that uh, you mentioned is with respect to um, diversity, you, you say that despite the evidence, many organizations are using a leaky bucket in their approach to diversity. What is that leaky bucket and how can leaders view diversity and more importantly, inclusion differently in their organizational culture? Well, I, if, first of all, uh, uh, one of the very important um, mechanisms for uh, 
uh, practicing diversity and inclusion is obviously the team. Uh, it, what you would like to have for the most effective impact on performance is a team that's comprised of, of diverse individuals with different uh, backgrounds, able to make different kinds of contributions. Uh, having them there is the first step. Uh, getting the contribution uh, that diversity can provide is the more important step. And that's where we come to the idea of conclusion, inclusion. Uh, managers uh, uh, are not trained well for inclusion. Our training for inclusion is woefully weak in, in too many organizations. And therefore, uh, we don't get the benefit of diversity, particularly in creative organizations where ideas are so important and um, uh, the notion of collaboration and, uh, and cooperation is, is also important. The idea that every voice needs to be heard, uh, that we don't uh, 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 shout down the person with the extreme opinion. Uh, you know, we used to have a uh, one of the principles of uh, of uh, uh, the practice of uh, uh, throwing ideas out on the table was that we don't we don't reject anybody's idea. First of all, we get them all up there, right? Uh, and uh, I think we've forgotten that uh, to some extent. Uh, because uh, it's still the case that too many people are not heard, their ideas are downplayed, uh, and don't make it to the level of the organization where they should be uh, uh, considered uh, importantly uh, as real contributions to potential products or new processes or uh, what have you. Um, uh, again, it's a matter of, of uh, management, uh, education and training, and um, our managers really, uh, you know, inclusion can be enforced on, or, or uh, uh, diversity can be forced on them. Inclusion can't. It's up to them uh, to include the members of their group that may have these outstanding ideas. And that uh, training, that learning is absolutely critical for all leaders and at all levels of the organization. Absolutely. Make, make a point that this uh, change is not just something that the most senior people in the organization and culture right. uh, is not what uh, they need to focus in on. It's something individuals need to be able to lead at all levels of the organization yes. to make the right culture reality. Right. Now, uh, you also mentioned, uh, Professor Heskett, the importance of trust. You quote Brian Chesky, co-founder mm -hmm. and CEO of Airbnb, um, talking about things moving at the speed of trust in the organization. So right. how, can, how can leaders uh, have a greater sense of trust with respect to their organizations, and what role does trust play in organizational culture? Well, uh, as I point out in the book, uh, the elements of trust that uh, I believe are important are really uh, pretty straightforward and can be summed up in the idea that uh, we will do what we say we will do. Uh, we will meet expectations. Uh, this is something that came from my work in service management, where we found that uh, if you uh, uh, meet or exceed a customer's expectations, there's a huge upswing in, uh, in loyalty. And uh, so the idea of meeting or exceeding, uh, but just, just doing what you say you will do is really important. Um, I think it's Ursula Burns, who, when she was CEO of, uh, of Xerox, uh, chastised the organization for having meeting after meeting in which people 
promised that they would do something by a certain date, leave the meeting, and nothing would happen. Uh, that's how you destroy trust. So it uh, got to the point where apparently in her organizations, very few people trusted each other. If you don't have trust, well, let's talk about it in the positive sense. Trust enables you to uh, rely on somebody else doing what they say they are going to do by a certain date. Trust uh, in a set of values uh, allows your organization to work remotely uh, in a very uh, successful way, confident that everyone is following the same set uh, of uh, ideas, procedures, values, what have you. Um, that's how organizations work successfully in a remote fashion. I mentioned in the uh, in the forward to the book that uh, one of the things that uh, got me interested in uh, in the uh, uh, subject really uh, was a case study that a colleague of mine did about Jim Burke when he was CEO of of uh, Johnson and Johnson and one of the company's subsidiaries had its uh, product Tylenol poisoned. Uh, Burke was out of the country. Uh, the company has a credo which uh, uh, lists several ideas to which everyone subscribes. So uh, the crowd in Chicago where this poisoning took place that actually led to seven deaths uh, uh, required, uh, 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 decided uh, that they had to act fast in order to get on top of this thing. Uh, Burke was in Japan, out of the country. Uh, they acted first and then informed him about what they had done. And what they had done was to pull all of that product off the shelves of every uh, store in the United States at a cost of $100 million to Johnson & Johnson. So it was no small, uh, no small matter. Uh, it was based on trust. Uh, trust has driven Johnson and Johnson uh, to pretty pretty successful heights uh, over the years, and it can do that for any organization where people can rely on their colleagues uh, to do what everybody has agreed upon. I'm not going to say do the right thing, but it's it's what everybody has agreed upon. Uh, so that you know what's going on in another part of the organization, in another part of the world, in another part of, of, of uh, the, uh, uh, the company. And in, uh, that's how uh, organizations uh, build agility. Without trust, uh, it's impossible to be agile. And that trust is absolutely critical, Professor Heskin. One of the challenges that I find is in many instances when working with organizations, having conversations with some of their team members, specifically when it comes to addressing organizational culture, a certain level of trust has been broken and that people feel like, oh boy, been there, done that. We've had these conversations before, we've had yes. surveys before, and uh, it uh, brought to mind the story as I was reading your story about the TSA officer, I cracked up laughing because that's the experience that uh, I run into with so many organizations where people are thinking to themselves and saying, boy, oh boy, good luck, been there, done that, nothing yeah. changed. Right. <laughs> Uh, well, think think about the destruction of trust uh, in organizations like uh, uh, that I've cited in the book, like uh, Wells Fargo, or uh, uh, where uh, VW senior managers claimed that they did not know what was going on inside the organization, and uh, that uh, those the the people at the operating level had actually violated uh, company values uh, when 
given a set of objectives that were almost impossible to meet uh, without violating company uh, values. Or at uh, Volkswagen, for example, where uh, obviously engineers were uh, not told not to cheat uh, in devising uh, a way of, uh, of, of meeting uh, environmental goals while uh, also accommodating performance uh, in their products. Or uh, at Boeing, uh, where um, uh, there clearly was a lack of trust between engineering and top management uh, that led to uh, product uh, problems that Boeing really was uh, not known to uh, to have in the past. So, Profer Pro Professor Heskett, for leaders to reflect on uh, organizational culture, you have great frameworks, you have 16 steps that they uh, can go through or action items that they should reflect on. As people are listening to this conversation and are thinking to themselves, okay, I get it, culture is really important, understood, uh, that it serves as a platform for strategy. What would you say is one of the most important things for them to reflect on, in addition to also reading your book? And what would be a first step to take for leaders to impact their organization and culture? Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, it's important to uh, reflect on the uh, uh, on what is a shared understanding among managers. Uh, do we all subscribe uh, to the same set of values, agreed upon behaviors, or what portion of them uh, do we not agree on? And uh, what are we doing to address those uh, differences of opinion. Uh, uh, going back to Johnson and Johnson, uh, Jim Burke, after this incident that I described, uh, uh, said to his organization, "Okay, now it's time. We're going to look again uh, at the credo, the company's credo, and I want you to tell me uh, how we should change it. Which one of these things do you believe in? What don't you believe in? What do you think is a problem?" Uh, so uh, you've got to uh, start at least by assessing the degree to which people subscribe uh, to a set of values that probably are already in existence. Uh, I mean, uh, culture forms either by itself or with a little encouragement from, uh, from management. Uh, and what, which of these uh, uh, things about how we do things around here, do you agree with or not? That will get the process started because if we all agree on uh, a certain set of things, then we, we at least have the basis uh, for moving forward. If we don't, then we had better uh, uh, develop some convergence in what we believe in. Uh, but just because we all agree on the values and the way we do things around here doesn't mean that those are going to serve us well in the future. It doesn't mean necessarily that uh, we're going to have a culture that will support more than one you know, a, a strategy over time. So uh, we've got to ask ourselves, look, uh, how do we write the story about this company's performance five years from now? And what kind of values and, and processes uh, do we need to have to get us there? And how do those relate to where we are now? I, I cite the, the from to example at Microsoft uh, in the book. So what do we need to, what do we need to change? And uh, do we all agree on whether we need to change that? Well, that set of discussions prior to the, uh, or in the early stages of those 16 steps that are outlined in the book, uh, will, will provide us with a launching pad for a process as, again, that's described there, that, uh, uh, that will 
allow us to change our culture in a reasonable period of time. At Microsoft, uh, six to 12 months. At Uber, around nine months. Uh, it can be done, uh, as those organizations have shown. There are also devices then that are des uh, described and suggested that will enable us to maintain an effective culture. For example, every time we make a strategic decision, is there somebody asking uh, what impact is it, 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 does it have on, uh, on people's trust? Is there somebody asking whether or not that decision conforms with the values that we've all agreed on? Uh, is there somebody asking whether or not the way we're going to go about doing this is uh, compatible? Uh, with how this organization works. Uh, at Southwest Airlines, there always seemed to be somebody saying, uh, wait a minute, uh, how does this fit uh, with our culture? You know, uh, do we, are we going to uh, destroy our trust with our employees? Uh, we better watch out about that. Uh, whether you have a, a, a culture committee, which uh, is not necessary, or whether you have people who just think about those things and bring them up from time to time, uh, it is uh, unimportant, but it's important to have somebody. Uh, furthermore, uh, I've suggested that as a CEO or as a manager at any level of the organization, uh, take five minutes at the beginning of every day and ask yourself, what's the most important decision I'm going to make today? Uh, how do I, uh, what am I going to, how am I going to make it? What, what, what is it going to be? And how compatible is that with the organization's values and behaviors uh, in terms of how I'm going to do it or what I'm going to say? Those frequent reminders will help in preserving an effective culture uh, in addition to the 16 steps that uh, that I've described uh, in changing uh, the culture in our organization. Those are great perspectives, Professor Heskett. And one of the things I would say is that I uh, uh, often repeat on the podcast too, there's a huge, dif huge difference between knowing what we're supposed to do and say and consistently yeah. doing it. So yes. uh, what I urge people to do is to reflect on what you said, read your book, not just for understanding of the importance of culture and the steps to go through with respect to culture. However, it needs to be part of the ongoing conversation and ongoing operation. No, not because culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, snack. However, because that culture is an absolute critical part of enabling the organization, as you say, being a platform, the way tech companies talk about platforms for different strategies into the future. So Professor Heskett, I can spend hours talking to you, as you can see, about uh, organizational culture and you have uh, so much rich wisdom that uh, you've shared over the years, including my years studying your cases back at business school. In addition, <laughs> to your own book and uh, your own work. Are there any leadership practices or resources you typically find yourself recommending? Well, I, uh, I have always, I, I go all the way back to uh, uh, Peters and Waterman's book uh, uh, on excellence going back to the 80s. Uh, they were a big influence on me and I still think about things that they've uh, that they wrote about years ago that uh, are applicable to today's um, management uh, uh, environment. Um, I like to um, I read uh, uh, a number of the things that have been written uh, by Mark Benioff at salesforce.com. Uh, uh, the uh, and, and he's done a couple of books that uh, uh, have been quite influential. Um, obviously, uh, John Cotter's work on leading change uh, has been really important 
uh, to me. Um, the uh, uh, some of the things that John Bogle wrote have still inspire me, uh, uh, and and I suspect will continue uh, to do so. So, so those are some of the influences that uh, have been important to me. Uh, I would just add one footnote to what you said, Mahan, just uh, recently, or just, just now. And that is the importance uh, for a leader of telling those stories, the stories that reflect the values, that reflect the way we do things around here. And what I've tried to do is sprinkle a number of those stories through the book because uh, leaders that rely heavily on organizational culture for the success of their uh, 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 companies, uh, they tell stories and they tell them over and over uh, until people become sick of them. The stories get better and better the more times they tell them but just keep telling those stories because the stories are what uh, enable people to understand what we're all about uh, and they help unify us uh, with a sense of purpose in achieving our objectives. And that's beautifully said, Professor Haskett. Uh, I truly believe that the power of storytelling that you also mentioned in the book uh, is critical because it's the stories that communicate values, the stories yes. that communicate what the culture is, and the stories that become memorable. It is not the posters on a wa wall or words that we write right. down. The stories become memorable. And so true. Whether it is for uh, external customers or it is for people within the organization, to know mm -hmm. what is important and what is not. Yes. Now, you uh, also quote Ben Horowitz, who um, has written a lot himself, uh, a yeah. successful entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. He wrote Hard Thing about Hard Things. And uh, he says that if you don't systemically work on your culture and consistently work on your culture, then two thirds of it will end up being accidental. And then the rest of it will be a mistake. <laughs> So the challenge yes. to leaders listening to the conversation right now is that there needs to be intentionality behind the conversation around culture. And it is not something that happens once a year in offsites when in person or Zoom meetings when not. It is something that needs to consistently happen uh, in ongoing storytelling, interactions, yes. conversations with respect to strategy and decision making. I like the way Ben put that. That's why I <laughs> quoted him in the book. <laughs> Professor Heskett, I really appreciate um, uh, all you have done to contribute to my understanding of organizational culture over the years, including this outstanding book, Win From Within, Build Organizational Culture for Competitive Advantage, which in it you do a brilliant job talking about the importance of it, not just the importance of it from a soft perspective, because culture is not just soft, the hard perspective of the financial and other impacts on the organization, but also specifically frameworks for leaders to consistently think about and apply in their organizations to help elevate their organizations. Truly appreciate you, Professor Heskett, joining me in this conversation for Partnering Leadership. Thanks, Mahan, for having me.